you're searching all of the time. You spend lots of time searching for your socks, or you search for the subway stop, or any number of things that you're looking for in the visual world. How do you do that? Well, suppose you're looking for your cat. If your cat is sitting in the middle of a big white carpet, this is terribly easy. You immediately know where that, uh, where that cat is. If you were looking for your cat, on the other hand, amongst many, many other cats, that would be much more difficult. What's the difference between those two kinds of, those two kinds of searches? Uh, Anne Treisman, back in the 1980s, suggested that there really were two different sorts of visual searches. There were what she called parallel searches and serial searches. In a parallel search, it didn't matter what else was in the, the scene that you were looking at. Your attention was immediately grabbed by the target that you were looking for. The cat in the middle of the white carpet is one example, but you wouldn't use cats in the laboratory. So the example in the laboratory might be, suppose you are looking for a red dot in a field full of green dots. You can immediately imagine that it would not matter how many green dots there were. The red dot would simply be immediately visible to you. That's what Treisman called a parallel search. On the other hand, um, there are other situations where you can imagine Oh, let's imagine looking for one letter in a screen full of other letters. Maybe you're looking for the letter T among a, a bunch of letters that are L or just random other letters. Now the T, the target letter, won't just jump out at you. You'll have to search from letter to letter to letter until you find the target T. And if you're searching for... Um, if you have more items on the screen, it will take you longer to find the T. And in fact, the data show that the amount of time that it will take for you to find the letter that you're looking for increases linearly with the number of letters that you have on the, on the screen. So Treisman had this idea that there are the two kinds of searches, parallel search and serial search. But now imagine a slightly different situation. Suppose you are looking for a red T and the other letters on the screen are red and green. Now you can imagine that you'll still have to search, but you won't search through all the letters. If it's a red T that you're looking for, you will search specifically through the red letters on the, uh, on the screen. You won't search through the green letters at all. And when your attention is restricted to some subset of the, the items on the screen, that's what you would call a guided search, or at least that's what I called a guided search when I began to develop the guided search model back in the late 1980s. Um, now, those searches are going pretty fast. Remember, we were talking about looking for a T among other letters. If those letters are big enough that you don't have to fixate on each one, one after the other, um, then you can process about 20 or 30 letters every second. If you have to move your eyes to look at each letter, then you can only do about three or four a second. But if you have big items, you can process about 30, 20 to 30 objects every second. So you can really move pretty quickly in your, in your searching. So this human search engine really has parallel search tasks, and serial search tasks, but they lie on a continuum with guided search tasks in, uh, in the middle. Now, there turns out to be only a very limited set of things that will guide your attention in a, in a guided search. If you think about Google, if you do a search in Google, you can type anything you want into that uh, search box, and Google will do something with it. That's not true of the human search engine. For a human search engine, there are about one to two dozen fundamental features that will guide your attention around the field. Those include things like color and orientation, so you can find the vertical thing among horizontal things easily. Uh, you can find the big thing among small things. You can find, and then there are a bunch of things that are more subtle than that, like 
uh, lighting direction. If you're looking for the one object that is lit from below among items that are lit from above, that turns out to be easy. But there are lots of things that don't work. So if you're looking for um, one particular face, if you have a crowd of faces and you're looking for your mother, you might think, oh, you know, my attention will be guided to my mother the way it would, my attention would be guided to that cat in the middle of a white carpet, but that's just not true. It turns out that you would have to search from face to face to face in order to decide which face belonged to your mother. Now, that might be a guided search because if your mother has, let us say, white hair, you won't spend a great deal of time searching through faces that are topped by black hair, but you won't be able to immediately look at a crowd of people and simply know that there is your mother present. The search vocabulary is limited to these few basic attributes, and then even within those attributes, your search is limited again um, by what you can say about each one of these features. So I said you could easily find the one big item, and you can easily find the one small item. It turns out that you can't easily find the one medium-sized item. You can, you can tell a medium-sized item once you pay attention to it, but to find medium, you will have to search around. Similarly, you can find, oh, the red item or the green item, but you can't say that I would like to find exactly a 602 nanometer red light among these other red lights, even though perceptually you could tell the difference, it will not guide, it will not guide your attention. You're also limited, it turns out, probably to just one attribute per object. So you can look for the object that is red, but it turns out to be much more difficult to look for the item that is red and green if there are other items in the world that are red or green. And what's kind of amazing is that even though you have all these very severe limits on uh, what you can search for, under normal circumstances out in the world, most of your searches are very easy. This very limited vocabulary is enough to help you find the cat or find your mother. The cases where it's not easy are sufficiently notable that, um, uh, well, that we have expressions for them, like finding a needle in a haystack. That is not going to be a very guided search, and we know that that's, you know, th th that's the sort of thing that's going to be difficult. Most of the time, search tasks are quite easy. Now, it gets more difficult when our civilization invents search tasks that, are, um, that we were not really built to do. So, for example, when you go to the airport and the uh, person at the checkpoint is looking for guns, bombs, and knives in your carry-on luggage, for example, that's a very difficult search task. Or when a radiologist is looking for cancer in a, uh, an x-ray of a breast or of the lungs for lung cancer, um, these are, are difficult searches. People become experts at doing those tasks, but interestingly, they become experts at using the same search engine that everybody else does. If you go to medical school, you become a radiologist, you're marvelous at finding lung cancer, you have not grown a new search engine, you have simply learned how to use your search engine, the basic human search engine, in, a more, in an effective way for that task. So, even though you have become an expert, let's say as a radiologist or as an airport screener, the experts are still not performing at the rate that we would like them to perform. So, for example, in North America, a really good radiologist screening for breast cancer will miss about 20 to 30 percent of cancers um, that are presented to her. And obviously we would like to miss many fewer, fewer of them. One of the ways to try to do that is to get the computer and the radiologist to collaborate together. Computers can actually be trained to do rather effective visual search too, 
but it's, uh, it's far from perfect. Well, it's also not perfect. A good computer is about as good as a good radiologist. You would think that a good computer plus a good radiologist would be much better than either of them, but so far, that's only, that's a promise that has not really been delivered. Computers plus radiologists or computers plus airport screeners, any of these places where an imperfect computer and an imperfect human are working together, it turns out that it's a little better if they work together, but it's, uh, but it's not as good as it, as it should be. We think that many of the reasons for this have to do, again, with human psychology, not with the computer, that the problems have to do with the willingness of the radiologist or the airport screener to trust the information that the computer is giving them. And an interesting area for future work will be to see how we can get computer-aided detection systems to work more effectively with the experts who we have doing these important search tasks. <laughs>